Speaking of popcorn, a lot of popcorn was consumed at the at the link, as they call it, the Lincoln Fidelity Financial Fieldhouse, whatever the f- that name of that stadium is, that they had the WrestleMania in this weekend. Boy, what a how is it the way that is it the way they're shooting things, the way they're lighting things? It looked like it was twice as big as Wembley Stadium, did it not? On these shots and the drones and the aerials and the pans and the sweeps and the jibs and the jib jabs. You know, for everyone that focuses on how good it is to get Vince McMahon away from this company due to his misdeeds or alleged misdeeds, let's look on the other side. It was good to get him away from the company creatively and in terms of the stranglehold on production that Kevin Dunn had, it has opened up a whole new world to WWE. Wow. I mean, it's night. Now, how, how would you feel if you were Bucky Beaver and you're sitting at home counting your millions of dollars that you got in small, unmarked, non sequential serial number bills, and you realize that everybody is remarking, Jesus Christ, thank God he's gone. Do you think he's, like, texting Vince criticizing the show? Do you think they watch it and, like, text each other? What the fuck could you criticize? Spielberg would have problems criticizing this fucking thing at this point in time, wouldn't he? Right, again, Kevin Dunn... I'm sure he can criticize. Oh, they're not jerking the camera back and forth to cover up for... She's not pretty enough. Well, and that's just... Well, I'm not even gonna... (laughs) I don't don't want to make any remarks of any... I don't even know where you're going, but just stop. I was gonna... I wouldn't... I don't know. It probably wouldn't have been as bad as I thought it would be now in hindsight, but nevertheless... We got WrestleMania to cover. So the stadium looks amazing. It was 52 degrees, felt like 48. How would you like to have been out there in your speedos, Brian, for that particular night? I wouldn't have wanted been out. I wouldn't have wanted been out there. I wouldn't <laughs> have wanted to have been out there in my coat for like six hours watching wrestling. A baseball game, four hours with extra innings. That's a long time to be outside in the middle of the day in that kind of weather. Well, yeah, well, at least they, they brought, that's why they're breaking it up. Instead of freezing the people stiff, they do three or four hours each night. It's a little easier to take, but, um, they should sell WrestleMania portable heaters and give them to the fans and bring them to the stands. (laughs) Maybe they could, they, they should have just given everybody uh, some kind of, you know, methane torch that couldn't have gone wrong. They could have gotten a vodka sponsor, just passed around the vodka all around the stadium, like Russia. Everyone, no one will feel the cold then. No, actually, you know, that makes you more susceptible to cold. That's a false narrative that's been put out there by all the cowboy movies. What? Wait, hold on. First of all, it's not the cowboy movies. It's the people from Eastern Europe who started well, drinking no, vodka. You see, when you watch the old cowboy movies, they're trying to warm up the guy that's been caught in the glacier. Give him a shot of whiskey there, whiskey or whatever. Not vodka, whiskey. Well, it's alcohol. It's the same thing. Brandy in the goddamn... Brandy? In the Yukon. Not that brandy. Brandy in the Yukon? Where can I the see drinking that? drinking brandy. Oh. Went around the dog's neck. I know I'm not narrowing it down any. What I'm trying to say is that with a cask that is around the St. Bernard's neck that they have the brandy when they rescue the people from the fjord up there with Plune and Falco and Fulco. But it, it, that's, a, that's a misnomer. It actually makes you more susceptible to the cold in some fashion, drinking alcohol instead of fortifying you against it. So we, that's a public service. And look it up. I think vodka has magical powers when it comes to cold. You could do anything in the cold. If you drink vodka, (sighs) you've never spent time in Brighton beach. That's why there's so many Russians is what you're saying. You can do anything in the cold. If you're drinking enough vodka. Well, one thing has nothing to do with the other. That's not why there are so many Russians. Well, if you can do anything in the cold, it's cold there most of the time. So speaking of a cold place, which was Philadelphia at WrestleMania. And who is Coco Jones who sang the national anthem? Not exactly sure, but she did a good job. Well, she hey, got that going for her What there. did that tell you? You want to talk about a new era? It wasn't America the Beautiful, which is what Vince McMahon always preferred. But it was God Bless America the next day. Yes. Is that another one of Vince's? I don't know. Maybe they just didn't want to do the same song two nights in a row. Wasn't a story always that Vince didn't like the national anthem? So he would just have people sing God Bless America? Or not God Bless America, but uh, America the Beautiful? America the Beautiful. What what, what did Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul, what did she sing? America the Beautiful. 
Oh, well, Larry, that's what he liked. Well, Ray Charles sang it at WrestleMania too, and you know, famously on record, that's the best version there is. Well, but that was the best Vince intro of of talent at Wrestle. That's the one that Bruce usually uh, does the imitation of. The Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. Yeah, I saw Bruce at WrestleMania. He's doing an imitation of Aretha Franklin in more ways than one. No, come on now. Hey, he just heard that Heyman was on a, a diet plan, and he figured he'd take over the Hitchcock chair. <laughs> so let's get back to this show, which they had here. It, it, because at the start of night one, we're seeing a, a thread being uh, strung up here, strung up potentially, the Triple H era. Everybody say, everybody talking about it. And here came Triple H. Welcome to a new time, a new era. Welcome to WrestleMania. And that's all he said. But that was, I, I wrote on my notes, I was like, was it worth the long walk down there? But he wanted to make a point. He's now the baby face in charge of the company. It's not an evil empire anymore. They have finally gotten, how long have we been talking about? God damn it. How much longer can they all be evil? And the answer is they don't need to be evil anymore. Now the heels can be evil again instead of the company. And the people are responding to it apparently because they're hotter than they've been in ages. And so now not only is he the the babyface CCO in charge, but now he's been able to babyface the the good McMahon member, his wife, Stephanie. Don't judge her by her blood. Judge her by her marriage. She's the one McMahon that could, the name can be mentioned on television, which we'll get to at night, too. But um, they, they've, they've transformed it. Now the company is doesn't have to be the heels anymore. It opens it up for, except for the board of directors guy. And this 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 way they 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 have rectified a wrong that's been existing for quite some time in that the reason why AEW had a brief flash of fucking can't say brilliance, life, spark of life before they settled firmly in the fucking bottom of the bowl was because people were so mad at the WWE as a promotion. Is that not what we've been saying for years? People were wrestling fans and they were fed up with the biggest promotion being run by Vince McMahon. Not necessarily yes. because of him, but the style of wrestling he was promoting. Well, now, the, the, now you could say it's because of him completely, but it was really the style and the presentation. The style of it and the, the fact that you couldn't count on there being a, a beacon of authority in the company because Vin, you could never trust Vince, right? He always wanted to be a heel. He was a great heel for years, and then, but not for years and years and years and years. Anyway, but what did you think, Brian, of Triple H's brief but poignant statement? Well, you know, you said it. I don't know if you got to see the press conferences either night, but after night two, Triple H addressed it. He said, Paul Heyman's really the one that did it. He started calling it the Paul Levesque era. Now that's a thing. You know, who knows if that's really the way it was uh, conceived. But he said, it's not just me. It's me, it's Lee Fitting, the head of production, and it's Nick Khan. And if you think about it, instead of one Vince McMahon-like creature at the top, yeah. you got someone who can worry about just the wrestling. You got someone who can make the business deals that make the wrestling work. And you got someone who can find a way to make it look different than it ever has before and better than ever before. It's a winning combination. You wonder, yeah. about, you wonder about Vince's influence. I mean. As long as he has one of his dildos still there, he's oh, got influence, and Bruce Pritchard's still there, and that's what he is. So, you know, we got to be honest you, about you it. would never name an instrument of that description after, well, Brother, brother Love. Loved. Brother um, Love. <sighs> uh, well, but anyway, nevertheless, all of his instruments may be, may be neutralized for that use, though. They got to follow along in the uh, in a new path. But the fans are with it. Like you said, I mean, Stephanie's accepted. I mean, she got, if there were any boos, they were minimal when she came out night two and at the Hall of Fame, nothing. I mean, people were happy to see her, I think, in a way. People, well, people, were, happy to, people were happy to get away from Vince and whoever's on the other side, I think they're willing to accept. 
that may have been the canary in the coal mine, her being there without much, just being in the crowd at the Hall of Fame. Why shouldn't she be able to be there? But at the same time, there was no outcry, ban her. So then uh, Triple H got the great reaction on night one. And I understand in, in internal documents, they had Triple H going out in her place in night two, but then here came Stephanie. And the response was fine. And, you know, the same thing is that they're pushing the tagline that this is the the either the Triple H era, the Paul Levesque era, but it's a new era. And they have baby-faced those members of that family that were, by the accounts that we've heard and stuff we've talked about, they were the ones trying to avoid Vince for the last few years. Like, Jesus Christ, they left when he came and came when he left. Well, what was left on WrestleMania? Was that it? Was that oh, WrestleMania? It was that, no, that was the whole show, yes. No, they opened up night one. God, we're still there, but we'll move quickly now. Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. Mommy versus the man. And uh, again, Rhea had a band. They had a lot of bands, a lot of musical performances on, on these two nights, but they look. I I don't remember what their name was. I didn't write it down. They looked like death metal devo kind of. They were, but Rhea Ripley looked. She's a superstar. She is so far ahead of the you know most of the other women on the on the roster or in the business that you can't use the same scale. And she's so young. There's so so long for her to get in the movies. They mentioned that Becky Lynch had strep throat temperature of 102. That sucks to be sick on the week of the big show. Um, What's it like working ringside, let alone a match, if you're that sick? Oh, God, it's the, it's the shit sometimes, literally, depending on what you're sick with. In this case, being a sore throat and a fever, she had to feel horrible physically and head and, you know, not be able to... It, it just it be able to breathe properly, but uh, to, you know it, it. It always that's like one of your worst fucking fears is you're featured on a big show and you come down with something that's unavoidable. And but she worked through it apparently, and and that was the thing is that it almost sounded like a Carrie Von Eric excuse, uh, you know. But it was legitimate, but it could play into you know what eventually happened because she she didn't win so that at least there's some out there um but i'm not going to go blow by blow on these matches because everybody was trying to put all the twists and turns in but perception wise they they worked hard and fast here and not fast in a bad way but they kept the pace up and they worked hard and also it's the personalities and while Becky is painfully thin, uh, and you know, visually, just size wise, this is you know, a, a, a contrast with her and Rhea, the aggressiveness and the personality she makes up for it's people are behind her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, these two throw better punches and forearms than half of the fucking AEW guy, all of the Japanese guys that they import over here and half of the Americans on the AEW roster, the men. You know, <sighs> Becky's actual work is not athletically Charlotte or Ripley level, but she's got good psychology and the aggression and the little fireball personality that she's got makes up for, you know, much of that. Uh, but anyway, they got some they got some big two counts. The people were with it. They did that that spot. Did you see that where Rhea picked her up in the electric chair and they went over the top rope and Rhea landed on her feet with Becky still on her shoulders and gave it to her on the floor? Amazing. That was, you know, some fucking uh, specialty shit. And again... They did a lot of big moves, but they sold in between. It wasn't just a video game. It was a struggle. They built it very well. And then 
finally, uh, Becky, they were at the fighting on the top rope. Becky was going to try the rock bottom off the top, but Rhea escaped and did the rip tied to the turnbuckle and then a rip tied in the ring. Boom. One, two, three. And it was a great match and the right finish. And as we talked about, I think on when we did the preview, this may have been, and people were saying it, that they'd bring Becky back and, well, she, we'll just put the belt on her at WrestleMania. And this was months ago when they were thinking about it because they've been building this a while. But <laughs> there's no reason to beat Rhea. There's no, there would, if Charlotte was back, right, there's no reason to beat Rhea. She's hotter than, than any woman has been since what the last time Becky was hot or whatever. So I think she's got a, a ways to go here. D did you like this contest of the immortals? I thought it was all right. You know, I'm always a mark too for uh, the look of outdoor shows when the sun starts to go down. And, you know, the sky is not just middle of the day bright. I like the look of the stadium. Just another tequila sun. I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh. Neither does anyone else. But good match. Uh, Rhea's grown her hair out. Whatever that means. Maybe nothing. She's, well, <laughs> she's an observation. She's growing her hair out. Some deep psychological fucking workings going on there. Her hair grew. Maybe she is going to Hollywood. Well, that wouldn't have any... She, you, you can have all styles of hair in Hollywood. It's, a, it's an equal hairstyle opportunity uh, community. You know how many out-of-work hairstylists there are? Maybe she's growing her hair to give someone some extra work. This is the stupidest Being, conversation we've ever yeah, had. Yeah, I, I don't know where if it's it's gonna. The eclipse is later on today. Are you sure the effect of the moon is not moving your brain fluid around? I'm behind the sun right now. All right. Well, purely dreary hosted some kind of look at the teams in the ladder match, and I decided, okay, I'm gonna skip this video and the fucking ladder match. Hey, next to time, surprise, surprise. Next time they're on, watch them just for one no. reason. No, I said it to you last time, and I watched it, and I was like, holy shit, they act the same way the Bucks do. The acting. Hey, watch like their I acting. See that? No, but you gotta it's ridiculous. That's what makes because they're a ridiculous tag team. It makes more sense for them. Then the EVPs, you got to see it, though. They act the same way. It's the same style of <sighs> acting. It's not Strasburg. Uh, Goldberg potentially could come Iceberg. in and spear them all. Uh, but no, as anything that those two have anything to do with, I can't stomach. We're talking back about purely dreary now, not the buckaroos, although that would apply. But also, these these... Teams are jokes to begin with, and not. I'm not talking about everybody as a, as a talent, but the way they've been presented. It's a 12-man, six-team ladder match, which is the worst stipulation I can possibly think of. And to make it worse, uh, the goddamn... The, they've had the tag team titles unified, and now they put both sets of belts up there, and there were two... Teams that won the championships of the various television shows in the same match. It, and you, I'm sorry, between the package, the entrances, a garbage indie fucking furniture match, and the finish, it was 30 fucking minutes. And yes, I went back and looked after you mentioned it earlier in the program before we traveled in time that. Waller and Theory got, because I'd zipped to the finish. I thought, okay, Miz and Truth did it, right? I didn't realize that Waller and Theory got the one set of belts, and then they had more match, and Miz and Truth got the other set of belts after more tables and stupid bumps and the fuck. Yeah. What'd you think of the match? Fun match. Fun match. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it. And Waller, well, in theory, got the belts. Kind of old school WWE style. They kicked the shit out of them, and then here's the belts. So let's see if they treat them any differently now that they have them. <laughs> Again, new era. It's the Triple H era. Waller's an NXT guy. Theory's an NXT guy who's all of a sudden saddled with Vince McMahon. So uh, we'll see. So the war the civil war of mexico annexing puerto rico cuba and the dominican republic was up next so 
Dominic is now, for the purposes of, I guess, because he's got Hispanic heritage and so does Ray, so he's on the other side. So we got Dominic Mysterio in with Pablo Escobar and all of his various lucha heel men and women. And they were facing Rey Mysterio and the newly turned babyface Andrade with all of the babyface lucha men and women. And I think we got up to, on SmackDown, we got up to 13 fucking people, right, in this thing. So it, it's busy. But they care about Rey and Dominic. And one th Andrade is working his ass off, apparently... You know, now that he's back there and rejuvenated after being able to escape the lunatic asylum that he was confined in for a little while, he he did the cross body off the. He had Rey Mysterio on his shoulders and stood on the apron, and they both did a cross body off onto two different fucking people. That was snazzy. Did you see that, Brian? Yeah, I watched. Well, good then. You can tell me what else happened because I, cause I, I, I zoned out a little bit. Yeah, this is not a match that you care about. Wouldn't... This is a SmackDown main event. This is not something yeah. that you're really going to care about for WrestleMania. It was a good I did, match. I, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't fast forward through it, but I kind of zoned out till you know, they got heat on Ray and then the finish. But uh, it, 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 I was trying to figure out where they would go because I was like, how can they put more people in this thing? For the folks who haven't seen it yet. Andre makes his comeback, a lot of moonsaults, girls do moonsaults, everybody did dives, and then two big mass guys stop Dominic from using a chair at ringside, and then Ray 619, Dominic and Escobar, and then splashed Escobar 123, which was the right thing. You don't want Ray to pin Dom at this point, no reason. But the two mass guys were the fucking giant bearded guys i'm like who the fuck have they put in the group now and they took the masks off and they were two members of the philadelphia eagles which apparently people there there was more people there than we thought from philly because they got a, a halfway decent pop they recognized well also one of them is a kelsey brother one of them date his brother dates taylor Swift. is he the is he the, the kelsey family the origination of the phrase deader than kelsey's nuts i'm not so sure about that but his brother dates taylor swift and they together have a popular podcast so it's not just people in the philadelphia area he's a national oh. nationally known personality now so they know him all over the place. And I guess his nuts aren't dead. Well, his nuts might be dead, but his brother's nuts are doing well because he's dating Taylor Swift. If you get a vasectomy, do you consider that? If, if someone named Kelsey gets a vasectomy, is that technically deader than Kelsey's nuts? Well, no. Or does just not count as the death of the nuts? It's just he didn't know the nuts weren't loaded is what it would be. Man, they had some article in the paper the other day that there was some guy getting a vasectomy when the earthquake happened around <laughs> <here>. <laughs> uh, They had like a picture of him holding an ice bag. <laughs> All right, well... Alrighty, so anyway, and then the moil. And then the moil. The moil. Uh, so anyway, after that, Little Wayne came out Lil. and did something. Lil, not Little, Lil, like Diamond Lil, Lil Wayne. Oh, so Lillian Wayne came out. <laughs> not Lillian. And but... did, well, that's what Lil is, Lil, like Lillian Ellison. That's where Diamond Lil, Di Lillian was the name, Lillian Russell. So is his name Little Wayne or Lillian Wayne? It's Lil, short for a little. It's an abbreviation of little, as you know. Like well, Lil, that... Lil Al, like Lil Al Vavasour. No, he was that was a fr he was French because he was from a Cajun from down there in Louisiana. So that Lil didn't mean he was little. It was that was his first name, Lil. No, it wasn't. Lil Al Vavasour. And uh, Lil Wayne is from New Orleans, so he's Cajun too. Well, there you go. That is his name is apparently. Lil. Apparently his real name is Dwayne, funny enough. Dwayne Wayne? Dwayne. <laughs> no, Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. I don't know where Wayne came from. <laughs> well, all right, little, all right. Then Lil Dwayne. And that makes The Rock Big Wayne. Came out. No, he's Big Dwayne. Not Big Wayne. Well, his name is Dwayne, but he calls himself Lil Wayne. That would make The Rock Big Dwayne. 
I thought his name is is Little Dwayne was oh, his Wayne. name. Big Wayne, I mean. No, no, this Big guy's no. this guy's Little Wayne. <laughs> what does he do for a living? Let me say this. He was the biggest thing in hip hop and rap in like 2008. Like big, massive. But you know, sometimes okay, things what happened? sometimes okay. things don't translate to the live show. Did a safe fall on his head and he lost his abilities? That was, I have to, usually I defend all the hip hop stars that appear on these shows because I don't think they're as bad as you do. This was really bad. <laughs> this was really, really bad. I almost wanted to ask for a refund on the pay per view, but, uh, and then the match didn't help any because little Dwayne Wayne, Wayne from fucking New Orleans, was accompanying Jay Uso for the match with Jay and Jimmy Uso fighting each other. And, Boy, howdy. We've been prophesizing for a few weeks now. I've been mentioning that, I don't know, Jay's hot-dogging, and they're, they're just, their work is not smooth. I mean, we we beat around the bush, but like I said, when it was Jay and Solo, we do not need to see any more of these brothers wrestling each other. This what. <clears throat> The full body outfits that they come out with in, or come out with in, come out in are off putting to begin with, especially that sequined parka that Jimmy was wearing for a while. And then they take the top off, but the pants look like I don't fucking know. And they, they tried. I can't say there's, they were serious about what they were doing. They tried to do it. They just didn't do it well. Everything is, it's sloppy. The dozens of super kicks over and over. The, the, just the Uso-isms. Like I said, it worked when they were a team and there was somebody else with some other type of style in there interacting with them. But it went one-on-one -on -one together, one for me, dog. And then at some point, Jimmy asked Jay, please don't kick me anymore. I'm sorry for everything. And Jay helped him up, and then Jimmy turned, super kicked him, and hit a splash for a two count, and then Jay hit him with a spear and a splash, one, two, three, and it came to an end. Dissect this for us, Brian. I'm not going to dissect it too much. It was one of the worst matches I've ever seen, one of the worst matches easily I've ever seen on a WrestleMania. They didn't mesh well together, but it's not even that. It's the pacing of the match. I hate yay boo but I hate calling it that anymore, even. Just trading blows back and forth, let alone just super kicks. This was painful, I thought, because what they were doing was taking forever. They finally got the crowd into it, and again, the crowd was a little hurt because of how cold it was when Jimmy did the spot feigning, you know, please leave me alone. At least they got the people into the story by the end, but as a match... This went on forever, and I thought it was awful. I hated it. He, oh, I thought yeah. I think you were being too nice. I just, I don't, I don't know what more to say to them. That guys, you gotta watch your videos, watch your tapes, or whatever the kids call them these days, and look at how this. No, y'all are neither one to rock. You can't get away with certain things, and you've got to fucking sharpen up your your smoothness because it's just it, you're all over the fucking place, and get some snap and some shit, and and come the the slap punches, all the things that we talk about, but it just uh, they're over as personalities as uh, Jay a little bit more than Jimmy, I think. When Jimmy went over or went over took over. Early in the match, the crowd kind of went, eh. They are fantastic as personalities. They have been great throughout the whole bloodline thing. It's the matches. Yeah. And this was the worst of them all. Because you got the two worst defenders in there against each other. The guy who wrestles the slow style where stuff looks like that against his twin. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just like two guys who wrestle the same way it's they're literal twins and they were doing the same shit and it took forever it just took forever this was brutal 
It wasn't Brett versus Owen. No. Because they did a lot of the same shit, but all that shit was so good. <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, yes. And, and we were... It's sad when Lil Wayne was the highlight of the match. <laughs> but his rapping was the highlight of this match. <sighs> And by the time they were done, we were over two hours into the into the night at this point because things were <laughs> Saturday night took longer in that weather. Into the night. And then came the six man tag that we'd all been waiting for. Carrie and Oscar and Dakota against Bianca and Naomi and Jade Cargill. The newly rechristened superstar on the WWE roster. And they had a big entrance for the baby faces. I wish that I was interested in or knowledgeable of fashion or whatever the, whatever's going on. They looked wonderful. It looked like fashion week out there in New York city. They have put a ton of, and I guess Bianca and Naomi would be getting something special even if if jade wasn't with them but boy with this trio and their new you know uh pot of gold being jade they've they gave them the moon here didn't they you know they like on the, the on the entrance i mean they give everyone big entrances at wrestlemania this was the three of them naomi a big return recently bianca's been one of the biggest stars for the last few years and jade if you're gonna do something with jade you got to do it right from the jump yeah the fans react to the entrance. I mean, it, it you know, again, with this production and the, the, the obvious way that they have orchestrated these things, because before it was always orchestrated, it was like, okay, get in the middle and pump your arm and we'll shoot it or whatever. But there, this is amazing. Anyway, and then the bell rang. But no, they did a bunch of cheerleading routines in the match, which I wasn't particularly interested in until Jade tagged in at about the 10 minute mark she had never been in they're building it and then they're going to orchestrate what is going to happen and as soon as she tags in she cleans house on everybody and then the other one's all cleared out and jade hit her finish on dakota kai one two three so again there's they're not leaving anything to chance and Everything is coming off lovely here. Nothing to, uh, you know, in AEW, they just put her out there on live television and told her, face the camera, and you see what we got. So anyway, I think they're going to get a return on that investment better than whatever it may have been, better than Tony is going to get on Mercedes or... The previous investment of Page or the previous investment of all of his, you know, name brand uh, female acquisitions, don't you? You know, I think so. And you have to wonder if Mercedes had decided to go back to WWE instead of AEW, would she have been in something like this with the big entrance? Probably. Instead, she's in AEW and... <laughs> with, you know, with hopefully an exit plan. But Jade was someone that AEW actually tried their hardest to present strong. You know, she never lost until the very end. She had a stable. She had multiple managers at different points, a lawyer. She should have She should have had a lawyer behind the scenes trying to get her out of that contract. No, uh, that, that, yes, they, they did what they thought was pushing her, which was send her out to the ring and, and let her win a bunch of matches and put a bunch of non-interesting amateurish people around her. And now they have given her extra training. They are having producers not only work with her on her interviews, which are kept short and she memorizes, but also the matches, which are kept short and she memorizes. And the camera work is off the charts, and she's beating established people in front of millions of people on television. Anywho... Up next was one of my favorite matches of the weekend. It's not uh, any surprise there. The Intercontinental title match with Gunther against Sami Zayn. I'm dying to hear what you thought of this because it took us all for a surprise. Well, I was I was all the way there till I knew about five minutes beforehand what they were going to do in the finish. I was like, you got to be ribbing me because it just it couldn't be anything else at that point. 
But, Ed, we'll talk about it in a second. But uh, thoughts of the match, uh, Sammy had already, we've established his wife and his son were in the back, and he tells them, you know, he tells her, don't let him, my son be out there. I don't want him to see it in person, watch on TV, whatever. And then Gable told him, go out by yourself. You got this. I'm not going with you. And he gets a pep talk from Steen, too. So, <clears throat> the match was brilliant. In that Gunther looks incredible. He's always perfect, as we've talked about. Sami Zayn, I think I mentioned this back years ago before they ever even started, you know, doing all this, uh, pushing him on top as a single. I said, Sami can sell better than most people. And he's also been brilliant verbally. It's just he looks like he looks. I can't even say he looks like shit. He, just, he looks like Sami. For the kind of people who like that kind of thing, that's kind of, you know, but it, part of it helps the, his look actually kind of lends into his underdog persona. But the match was great because Gunther's going to dominate and the babyface underdog is going to fight from underneath, and this was a perfect dynamic for that. And the fans were into it, and these guys knew how to put it, put their match together, and they knew how to execute it. And they, again, they got big false finishes, two counts with power bombs and clotheslines out of nowhere. And Gunther's a heel. He got heel heat in front of Sammy's wife and his attitude and his facials, the way that he projects himself. So, and then you've, you know, got the ultimate baby face and this guy that looks like he ought to be working at a goddamn you know, video game store or comic shop, except that he's a WWE superstar, we can identify with him, right? He's one of us. He's the Eddie Marlin principal. He looks like one of the fans. And finally, I, wh where I knew was when, when Gunther started taking his time and a splash off the top, and then he hit a, another one, I think maybe two, but he, he wouldn't cover him. He's taunting the wife, and Sammy's fighting to his feet. And Gunther goes to the top like he's going to, you know, do something again, and Sammy runs, gives him the kick, and the brain buster on the top turnbuckle. And I don't know if you remember this, Brian, but I told you, years ago, when he was El Generico in Ring of Honor, look at that fucking physique. You, he is stronger than he looks. <laughs> Because he, he did that to Steen one time when Steen was even fatter than he is now. He can turn, he can pick the guy up and turn him to where the gravity can take over, which is no, you know, small feat. And he gave Gunther the brain buster on the top turnbuckle and then two of the kicks and covered him one, two, three. And it got a huge pop, yes, but I, what the fuck? It... And I'm not saying that Sami Zayn shouldn't be used as a main event guy. And a lot of people like him. He's very popular. But they had something going with Gunther that I think it needed to be either a really... A, it, it, it was this Seth thing after he's lost his world title. Or was this L.A. Knight's thing to uh, establish himself maybe one step up? Or was this Braun Breaker's thing to shock? Can you imagine, and maybe the closest we get to Gunther and Brock, Gunther and Braun Breaker, where Braun Breaker would explode onto the fucking main roster and, you know, get a win over this dominant beast. It... <sighs> Is Sammy really going to be that much more over at any point in time than he already is? And that's not a knock on him. I'd say he's already over. Did he need... The way they built it, people wanted to see it, but was this the time to spend Gunther's loss on a guy that's already in a prominent position? I don't know. Obviously, going into it, I wouldn't have done it. I've been saying all along, I said on the show months ago, it would have been Braun Breaker in my eyes at the time, just because it would have elevated him right away and given him credibility. Yeah. I think that the Sammy Gunther thing started really clicking because the Sammy Gable story did, too. And 
the comparisons between what's been happening in Rocky 3, where Rocky has to train with his former rival, Apollo Creed, to be able to get past the guy that beat him, Clubber Lang. Wait a minute, I thought that's the angle that Moxley wanted to do with Punk. Apparently it was, and they did it here. I mean, it seems like they're doing it with Gable and Sammy. Gable kept saying, I, I want one favor from you after this. That's what Apollo Creed kept saying. Yeah. He ended up wanting to box with Rocky in an empty arena just so he would know for himself who was better. I don't think they're going to do that. But they've set up some kind of story with him and Gable. So for that reason, I'm curious to see where it goes. And I don't know if I want a series of rematches with Gunther and Sammy, but this is a chance to do something new with Gunther. Look, they got a new world champion on one show and on both shows. This is the chance to do something new with Gunther. Well, we will... We will talk about those new champions shortly, but it's still night one, folks. There's things going on. And Nick Aldis and Adam Pearce came out to announce the biggest WrestleMania of all time of some description. They're going to have statistics on this that it, you know, but it, they've had more people in one place, but they've never had more people over two nights or whatever the fuck this is going to be. They've never had more people with more cash in their pocket. There you go. They've never had more people leave the arena with emptier pockets. That's what the statistic is. But 72,543 is what they gave us. That's the number they're... they're, they're but the turnstile count was only 45. Second, yeah, the turnstile count was 162. You know, like Buddy Fuller said in, in Springfield, Ohio, somebody left the back door open. 500 people somehow snuck in without anybody noticing. So the time for the main event was here, the biggest tag team match of all time. Uh, Cody made his entrance and hugged Mama Rhodes and gave his weight belt to his father-in-law. Brandy's father was there uh, alongside Michelle. And Cody adopted a Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club motif for his outfits this weekend. And it was the... Oh, it's classic Cody, man. Michael Jackson at the 4th of July. That's what it is. Well, well, there you go. And then Seth Rollins came out dressed in Ethel Merman's costume from her last Broadway play. Well, this was definitely the uh, the peak of flamboyant Rollins, wasn't it? it I think Liberace would have been seen as a fucking like an undertaker or a congressman next to uh, Seth at this in this juncture here. But and then The Rock came out carrying the championship belt that Mrs. Ali presented to him. And that I'm sure she might have not only paid for it, she may have crafted that with her own two hands. And then here came Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman. And we kicked it off with Cody Rhodes and Seth Franklin Rollins against Rock, Rock Roman and Roman Re Rock Reigns and Roman, Re the Rock and Roman Reigns. And when they did the face-off at the start, it, it, you had to think, physically, these two white boys are in fucking trouble, right? Because <laughs> that's Rock, and there's Roman, and they're jacked up. And the announcers mentioned that uh, Rock and The Undertaker are the only ones to main event WrestleMania in four different decades, which is pretty goddamn amazing when you think about it. Um, however, from this point on, Brian, there were points that I thought were, this is brilliant, this is psychology, this is wrestling, this is, these are professionals, and there were some points I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me, they got to do this too? Um, and, and they existed in the same match because this thing went, I don't know if it was 44 or 45 minutes bell to bell. And I'm not sure that in temperatures that had to be dipped into the 40s at that point with a an ill wind blowing slightly that that they got everything that they could out of the people even though they yes they were there they were with it it wasn't like you know the popcorn match but couldn't they have taken it easier on the people and the viewers at home and cut this down by about 15 minutes and still got the point across when has the rock ever gone short well it, it, but, God damn, if I was, my own self was physically uncomfortable and I was the one that could say, go home, I believe I might tend to do that. But um, 
there was a psychology lesson early on when they didn't they didn't rush it. They didn't hurry. They were getting pops for the tag ins just to see this guy versus that guy. And, you know, again, there, there was, it went from classic tag team wrestling early on to then suddenly the rock told the referee, I don't fuck around. If you count, you're fired so that they could just go out in the arena and fight Cody and Roman on the stage and Seth and, the Rock in the arena, and it was like every other match on TV everywhere and kind of spoiled what they had been doing, which there was some art to that in the ring, right? And I be- I fast-forwarded a couple minutes till they got back to ringside because I don't want to see that from guys who know what they're doing. And it- I'll give you a couple more re- reactions I had. Tell me if I'm overreacting. Rock took a lot of the fucking match, didn't he? As far as in the heat. He t- Roman was kind of standing of around it. quite often. Yeah. And then the, the Rock hit a nut shot and the referee actually apologized to Cody that he couldn't do anything about it. So if they're setting up some kind of special referee, and I'm not talking about for the finish of this match, if they're setting up some kind of deal where the next time that Rock is involved, there will be a special referee, then I can understand planting the seed. But if they just did it for just this match, then that was kind of, I thought, way too easy. The easy way out. Um, And then, you know, every time that Cody and Rock got their hands on each other, people wanted to see it. And... You know, they got numerous two counts with their big moves, blah, blah, blah. And then they did kind of a modern sequence where the rock just disappeared and the baby faces double teamed Roman Reigns silly. And then they went back to the rock, pulling the referee out and nailing him and wiping out Seth. And Roman got a nut shot and a spear on Cody. And the rock rolls the referee in, but that's only a two count. And then they get heat on Cody. And so there's a lot of points where they're building, they're taking people on a roller coaster, but they are using almost every one of the the Attitude Era false finishes all in the same match. Um, The Rock taunted Michelle with the weight belt, but Cody made a comeback and got the bionic elbow, and The Rock hit a spine buster, went for the people's elbow, but Cody cut him off with a cutter. And got cheers and boos for cutting off the people's elbow. And, the, you know, again, boom, boom, boom. Finally, they did a spot where the baby faces got double pedigrees and double covers and only got a two count. And then The Rock cleared the Spanish announce table off, but Cody rock bottomed The Rock on the American language table and Roman speared Seth through the rail. And it went on in the ring with more heat on Cody. (laughs) And Cody got two crossroads finally on Roman and was going for the third, but Rock had the weight belt on the floor and whipped him in the small of the back. Pow! And that broke up the third one, and Roman hit a spear. And then the Rock asked for the tag. And Brian, did you note that there was some element of they were looking at each other with Roman going, oh, you want the tag? But the only way I can, again, figure this out is if they're building to Rock and Roman and Rock being a glory hog or whatever the fuck, because as Roman spears Cody, Rock sticks his hand out for the tag, Roman tags him, Rock, Rock bottoms him and hits the people's elbow, one, two, three. So Rock gets the victory while Roman is kind of struggling to his feet in the ring after all the abuse he's taken. So this this was the Rock show. And you said they're building him up for Roman. They better be building him up for Cody, too. Cody needs that win back now that he's the champion, and I think that has to be the plan. This is what I said when we predicted the matches would happen. Rock pins Cody. Cody gets everything going the next night. Yeah. But again, like you said, 
even after the next night, just not to play spoiler, we'll get to that review. They really didn't tease much dissension between The Rock and Roman after the fact. So we'll see where the story goes and where Jacob Fatu goes and whatever else. Yeah. But this was all The Rock. And The Rock got the win. And, you know, Roman has now kind of become second fiddle to The Rock. Well, and and I agreed with you. And we've talked about that the, the heels were going to win night one, Cody win night two. And I agree with you that Rock should get the win because that way they've set that. Because we've talked about there's probably more money at this point in Rock and Cody than there is in Rock and Roman. But after the Roman spear, for Rock to come in and take that much time to milk the moves and blah, 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 I was envisioning something where Cody had ended up, you know, flattening Roman with some move or something and almost ready to make the goddamn cover. And that's where Rock waffles him or rock bottoms him or something from behind and gets it. But this was like, (laughs) while you're laid out and Roman's done all the damage, I'm going to do my shit. And it, yeah, boom, one, two. It was a little flat also. So, uh, and they got to give Cody a win back over the rock, probably on one of these big shows with a big budget, like Saudi Arabia or something, if I had to guess. Yeah. I don't know if they're going to hold that off to SummerSlam, but that's the next thing they've built up here is Cody needs that win back from the rock. And, you know, I guess they've kind of set it up knowing how they've done so many things long term with the bloodline. If we get to the point one day where the bloodline has enough of the rock and turns on him, there's the thing that gets him back to being a babyface. Which you would think would be the goal before he uh, disappears, not disappears, but Before, at some point, he's not going to be on television regularly. He would want to be a baby face riding off into the sunset. You would think. This is his monster heel moment. We'll see if he can keep capitalizing on it without overshadowing everything and everyone and it getting to be too much. But you would think the end game would be, you know, like Hogan. You come back and you get the one last heel run and then you turn baby face and that's the way we see you for the rest of the time. Because you're never going to be a full-time wrestler again. Okay, but now how old is Rock now? And we'll move on to night two. How old is he? 51, 52? 52, what I is... think. I think that's what it was, 52. Okay. Goddamn, he looks better than Hogan did when he was 52 and moves better too, doesn't he? He held up on this thing. There was no, you know, uh, bring the oxygen tank to ringside. Rock needs a hit. Well, we will stay tuned to Dr. James Andrews and find out what happened after the fact. Okay, he was moving around pretty good the next night. Yes. For a guy that wasn't in the match the next night, he was moving <laughs> <Yeah>. around great. <laughs> I just realized he wasn't even in a match the next night. Well, I mean, he got in the ring okay. Yes, he took that choke slam fantastically. Yes, he was all the way up in the air. Well, that was night one of WrestleMania, and I did like the way it ended. And I got to give him credit, because I've killed him for years. Michael Cole doing a much better job under this new regime. And Cody was down on the mat with despondent Rollins. You know, they pointed out Rollins is hurt. How's he going to defend the title the next night, which played into things? Yeah. But I thought this weekend, I thought Rollins did a great job for what he needed to be. Not like, you know, the outfits and everything, just what he needed to be to make all this work. And uh, that was a big part of the story. The baby faces left battered and beaten. He wants to thank his seamstress and his haberdasher. I want to thank and Halston. Those, <laughs> and, and Mr. Calvin Klein and Mr. Francesco Scavulo or whoever the fuck else made all this possible. 